Institute, New York. And Jane Stevens for the State Education Department. Thank you. And we have some members of the public also with us at this morning. I would like to thank all of you for your work and the effort that you have put with this committee. I know that you have been working very hard in reviewing this curriculum and the ideas. And we are looking forward, including the secretary and the governor, to hear the recommendations that you have to the governor at this moment and to hear the updates that the committees have. I know that the committees have been working and meeting more often than the full committee. So we will be looking forward to what you have to say today and to hear your recommendations. But before that, we're going to go to the minutes of last meeting. I guess that all of you already read them, and I would like to know if there are any changes or if you want to approve the minutes the way they are, or if someone has any recommendation or changes to it. Who answers the meeting right now? Hi, this is David Byatar from the African American Museum of Nassau County. Thank you. We are looking at the minutes of last meeting, and if there is no recommendation or changes, we would like to approve them at this moment. I so move. To approve the meeting. Anyone seconding this? Second. Second. Okay. So the minutes of last meeting are approved at this moment. Who entered the meeting right now? Julius Edwards, Syracuse, New York. Thank you. We're going to go now to the public section of the agenda. We have a couple of minutes for the member of the public to talk. So at this moment, I know that you want to. Jacob Morris. So you have a couple of minutes to talk to the committee now. Okay. Jacob, you may want to come so because there are a couple of. Yeah. Great. Let me hand this out. Why don't you pass this down? Yeah. Pass it along. Okay. What I'm handing out is a Boston's Freedom Trail, established in 1951. It now gets more annual visitors than the Boston Red Sox. Now, you know, the way I see it, things like this raise consciousness of history. This is the essence of public history. Now, good old Boston, they have this incredibly successful, and it's free. I mean, you know, you don't have to pay for a tour. You can walk it. People just walk it. But the magic is the official designation. From what I understand from a very nice commission member, you guys haven't passed any resolutions yet. So I'm going to ask you to, for your next meeting, to put this on the agenda. And if you decide to do that, then I will come forward with a full proposal for a Freedom Trail for downtown Manhattan. I'm responsible for Frederick Douglass Landing, the co-naming of Chambers Street. I'm responsible for Abolitionist Place in Brooklyn, the co-naming of Duffield Street. I'm responsible for the Reverend Pennington Place in Queens by Newtown High School, who presided at the wedding of Frederick Douglass while he spent time in David Ruggles' boarding house, which was literally, as far as I'm concerned, the grand central of the Underground Railroad. It has offended me that this is not in the history books. 
And when I first encountered this great history and New York City's role in it, I had to ask myself, um, this is the good part of the story. How come this ain't in the history books? You know, I mean, the bad part of the story, you know, you could, like, make excuses as to why that's not in the history books. But the good part of the story, and that's not in the history books either. Um, so, now, obviously, this is incredibly successful. You look at this. I mean, they got hotel packages. They got Freedom Foods <laughs> along the trail. You know, it's amazing. Um, you know... What I found up in Harlem, where I've been responsible for quite a few street namings also, is um, these namings and their official recognition by the government. And you guys have a role to play. You can make the Amistad Commission much more respected and known, frankly by doing tangible things that impact our public life and our public sphere. Um, when there's this tangible <clears throat> manifestation of respect by official government bodies, it raises the consciousness of our whole society. I was shocked when we did um, A. Philip Randolph Boulevard in Harlem that um, so many people did not know about A. Philip Randolph. They didn't know that he stood up to <coughs> President Roosevelt during World War II. They didn't know that he was responsible for the desegregation of the armed forces by forming the committee to, um, uh, to end Jim Crow in the armed forces in 1947 and was successful in 1948. Um, I mean, this is major stuff, and people don't even know about it at all. A giant of the 20th century. And then here, giants of the 19th century, black abolitionists here in New York City. Um, name after name, you know, besides David Ruggles, uh, Dr. James McCune Smith, sheltered freedom seekers in, in the basement of his pharmacy on West Broadway. And of course, uh, you know, City Hall Park, uh, the um, Oyster House, these were all um, points uh, on the Underground Railroad and uh, the abolitionist movement. The African Free School, phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Why can't we have a freedom trail in New York City in downtown Manhattan? It's concentrated. It would be easy to walk. Someone has entered the conference. And it would be a wonderful thing. So, what I'm asking is, put Someone a has proposal entered the conference. for Lewis the Amistad Commission to vote for a resolution calling for a freedom trail in downtown Manhattan that would tell the story of New York City's role in the abolitionist movement and the Underground Railroad. Thank, I thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for your recommendation. And the committee will take note of it and we'll look into it. Thank you very much. Now, I'll have to do some work if you guys decide to do that. I'm happy to do it. Very good. We appreciate it. Thank you. Anybody yours? I just have a quick, quick word. Um, what is your name? Uh, Lucia Smedley. You're going to have to come up to the table okay. because right. it's being recorded. Okay. Um, I've been working with the Harlem Children's Zone for quite a few years. And um, one of the main thrusts uh, for me and others is that our children do not know anything about who they are, their history, not just here from this being enslaved here, but in the past. And schools that have had uh, some element of that in their, in their, in their uh, curriculum, uh, the children do so much better. There are even schools who are African-centered where the children leap several grades when they know something about themselves. Uh, even when Obama was running for president, some of the professors would say the kids were sitting taller 
standing tall just by the fact that a black man was running. But to me, the key thing, when people talk about reparations and so forth, speaking about money, it's not money. It's understanding the kids could have about who they are, what they contributed to the world, and how that would make them feel and make them have progress. And it has been thwarted on so many levels when we try to do this in the schools that you almost feel it's a conspiracy. And I feel that through the Amistad Commission, you can really have a big push to see that that is changed. Because this has been going on, as Jack mentioned, quite a few years. And we don't really see any evidence of change in the schools. So that's what I would like to see you do. And I'd like to have more contact with you so we can, you know, some other ideas from the public to you. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. We will pass now to the committee reports. And I will pass now to Rose Marie Longo to take this part. Sure. Thank you. We can start with, I can give a general overview about the committees and what they've been working on. And then each chairperson can specifically report on each. But certainly the activities of the committee since we last met have all focused around identifying, creating recommendations for the governor office, which is one of the mandates of the commission. And in large part, the components and identifying what the components and what should be reported and recommended, including the activities undertaken to achieve the mandate that are required, as well as possible funding that's going to be required to move the activities of the commission forward. Having said that, there are three committees. The curriculum committee, K through 12, which is really mandated with, or sorry, whose chief goal is to develop the operating principles of how the activities are going to be undertaken by the commission with respect to curriculum guidance. We have the higher education committee, which is the natural extension for the K through 12 teachers, and as well as another constituency that certainly needs to hear the vision and mission of the commission as it relates to African American studies, teacher certification courses, and things of that nature. And of course, we have the resource committee, which is largely focused as the gatekeeper of the bibliography in identifying additional resources that may not be a part of our existing bibliography that's in formation. And so we're going to hear more from them, not only that, but also developing the constituencies and expanding our constituencies to include potential scholars. So that just gives you a broad context of the workings. So first, I'm going to hand it over to Mary Kennedy Carter, who can then discuss what the specific activities have been with the curriculum committee. OK, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. OK, good. I have to give kudos to Derek. Is he there? He is. All right. So he can certainly pitch in, because without him, this would not be the work in progress that it is. It is definitely a work in progress. We want everybody to understand this is not the definitive statement. However, what we have tried very hard to do is to make clear what we mean by infusion. And it is not inclusion. It is not add-on. It is not celebrating names and one day for Black History Month. It is infusing the work of the African people from the time they were on the continent of Africa to the time that they have come here to the Americas and have made their lives a part of the lives here. Now, there are a couple of things I want to notice in the second paragraph. If you have a copy of this, the word qualify is supposed to be quality. And also, the man I mentioned in the anthropologist, his book was written in 1994. Those are important points to me. But as I said, the first paragraph where we talk about the fact that the 
African American Odyssey starts in Africa. And then there was a rich cultural history there, which everybody needs to know because that is the foundation of our lives. And so it's not just the African American people who need to know it, but everyone. So then we bring the people over here and the contributions, the ideas, and all that they have done. Now, what we've also tried to include is, and I'll let Derek speak more to many of the ideas that he had here, but um, to notice that we are intent on including infusion into every aspect of the curriculum, K through 12, not just social studies, not just secondary, but the entire curriculum following the standards or going along with the standards that Joanne and the others have put forth for New York State. But you will notice, uh, those who have a copy, that we're talking about infusing into the seven content areas and uh, to be woven into the existing general school curriculum. But there's a lot that will have to be done because, as the people from the public have stated, there's so much not known. There's so much not in the books. So we have a gigantic task, but a critical piece in this whole program. Derek, I defer to you. I think she pretty much covered it. <laughs> so, without, you know, adding or just being too verbose, that's a good place to start out. If there's any questions, we can clarify any parts of that. But um, I think um, Barry hit it right on the on the head of what we were, you know, what we were, where we were coming from. Well, also, if I may add, uh, we, uh, Derek and I both talked a lot about culture because culture is so important, and uh, we want to make sure you know that this is part of the understanding of the infusion part that we do, right, Derek? Yeah, I think the understanding of culture is fundamental mm -hmm. um, because um, it it helps us it helps make the concept of infusion clear rather than looking at inclusion as just adding on holidays and people mm -hmm. names, is that the curriculum itself is a cultural product. So it's not like we're sprinkling culture on the curriculum, but it, it's, it's, it's a cultural fusion that we're looking for. We're looking to bring these things um, together. There's already African-American content in the curriculum, however much that there is. So there's some there, but there's also other places in the curriculum where that can be brought out where it doesn't seem as apparent. That's where the resource committee comes in and those other things. So infusion is not just about um, improving what's existing and staying in the social studies curriculum and those types of areas, um, but it also branches out into the entire um, curriculum, K-12, through where you can really look at just how to infuse it in places it may not be as obvious um, in order to make the teaching experience that much more relevant. And the other part of the statement was that a culturally relevant curriculum can't exist in a vacuum or by itself, but it must be concomitant with a culturally relevant pedagogy that brings this across. So those things are linked together, and that's why we left the focus with the classroom teachers as the integral linchpin in having implement the infusion process and bring it out, bring infusion lessons to the classroom. And that's where the challenges will be is preparing them uh, for that, to, to meet that. And that's, uh, I, I guess, how uh, the breakdown of the infusion process will work. Good. Sorry, um, I have to save your comments for the end, but just one second. Um, I think, um, Derek and Mary, it's important, though, to state that the purpose of um, the infusion statement is really as a, a foundation for the development of the recommendations. Um, and so the, the idea of today was to present to the full commission those on uh, the phone as well as around the table that this is really, gonna, really the, the operating principle by which curriculum guidance is going to be developed. Is that correct? Right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, or do the commissioners um, have any comments um, currently on the statement that was set forth as part of your minutes in the packets. I think everyone has a copy, and if you've had an opportunity to review and want, wish to comment on it as a commissioner, um, please do so. Now, there were two infusion things. The first short brief thing was, please throw that away. 
The other one where it says submitted by uh, Mary Kennedy Carter and Derek, that's the one we're focusing on, please. And Pam was kind enough to get that out to everybody. And that's the one that we have in front of us now, ma'am. Good, good. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Comments? Okay. Um, good. Um, anything else um, in terms of uh, uh, the uh, the um, again? Uh, this is uh, this is really what the committees have been working on is really a framework for. So uh, essentially, this is going to serve as an introduction as part of the recommendations um, that are set forth to the governor. Okay. So if you want to look at it with that light and have any comments that you want to forward, you can forward comments in writing to Pamela, and uh, we'll make sure they get integrated into this statement. Good. Do you guys want, have anything else you'd like to report? No, not really. <laughs> uh, we are taking all the advice that we hear from Rose and Joanne and others, which has been very, very helpful and appreciate their help. Okay. Um, all right, Higher um, Education Committee. Dr. Caban, Dr. Ballinger. No, I'm going to refer to Dr. Caban. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Good. Good. Um, thank you. As you know, uh, our work has been focused primarily on how we define a role for higher education in the work of the Outcome Stack Commission, both in terms of uh, preparing or helping assist in the preparation of a, a body of school teachers well-versed in African-American history and culture, and prepared them to incorporate as part of the, the curriculum, infuse the curriculum with this specific knowledge. The other uh, task we've focused on is how do we promote much more extensive coverage of the African experience as part of the, of the graduate educational experience at SUNY. And the first, the first issue our thinking is that the task of, in, of, of, first of all, you're developing a base of support within public education would be easier if we have teachers already well versed in African American culture and history. So the question would be, what can we do in SUNY to help prepare this body? And one idea we came up with was, why don't we contact all the teacher education through the SUNY system and begin a dialogue with them, primarily the provost or deans who would then uh, uh, prepare the groundwork for working with, uh, with the faculty to develop a curriculum within the public education program that focuses on not just acquiring knowledge and appreciation for the history, but focusing on new pedagogies leading to the infusion of that knowledge into the curriculum. Right? That is, someone earlier commented about their parents that uh, African American students could be an add-on, appendage, something that's tacked on to the curriculum without giving any thought to how it is part of that education experience so that educating them that body of teachers would have that both content in terms of acquiring substantive knowledge, African American experience, but also develop an appreciation as well as necessary to use their curriculum as knowledge and then to be able to teach it. The other the other item I'm thinking about is how we do have a number of African American studies programs and departments and academic units throughout the SUNY system. Uh, these vary widely from campus to campus. Uh, so consequently, the opportunity for students to acquire any kind of comprehension of the African American experience will, will, will vary depending upon you know, the resource available on particular campuses. So the other the idea we're thinking about is convening um, program directors of African American studies to develop a strategy by which we might be able then to exercise leverage to promote more expansive coverage of, of that experience in our, the rest of our, our, our campuses. And some campuses do have programs that are, 
that are really vital and robust, and those may offer a course or two. Um, ideally, we would have a system-wide approach for maximizing uh, the opportunities for undergraduate students throughout the state to acquire African-American experience. I would think those are the two primary um, areas we're going uh, toward. We already have compiled the list of the African-American studies directors throughout the SUNY system, and we have compiled the list of the um, teacher education programs. But a ways to be done is a strategy to look these communities and then seek their involvement in our work. I would just add on to that that we are also looking at private colleges and universities in both phase one and phase two of what Dr. Kavana just stated, phase one being uh, <clears throat> reaching out to those teacher educator programs first and then expanding it to the course offerings, those campuses having African-American course offerings. And the last part of that is uh, always keeping in mind that in higher education, um, there is a concept of shared governance and maintaining a um, input with the, the academic senates on the respective campuses and the academic senate at large. So the recommendations then are going to include um, the various activities in terms of engaging these different uh, target stakeholders. Is that correct? That's correct. That's okay. absolutely correct. Very good. Um, is there, and I think it's important to note, though, that um, while while this mandate has been unfunded, um, part of the recommendations is to include um, the associated costs, uh, albeit in a very responsible way given our current economic environment, but necessarily, you know, in order to carry on some of these activities, costs are associated. So we will also be um, presenting a budget along with these activities um, to the governor's office in order to assure that there is um, two things. One, responsibility on our uh, behalf um, to make everyone aware that these things do um, have costs. But the other thing is, um, as part of that, Dr. Bellinger, you've continuously said that um, raising funds from the private sector, um, whether they be foundations or not, um, are important to the Commission's work as well. So um, a statement on that and proposed um, strategy um, will also be included in the recommendations. Absolutely. I think that it behooves us on a go forward basis. Can you hear me? I apologize for my voice. Uh, on a go-forward basis, if the, sub if the committees could keep a running track of what your in-kind contributions are as far as the number of hours that you have devoted and uh, what the average salary is, that will help tremendously in both leveraging a future on a go-forward basis for our private funds as well as looking at some, some state revenue if available. Okay, well, thank you both. Does anyone have any questions for either Dr. Caban or Dr. Bellinger? Well, I do. This is Mary Carter again. And uh, one of the things that um, I hope all of us will focus on, I'm listening to you talking about the teacher education program and the African American studies and so forth. But one of the things, when we talk about the infusion process, and I'm not sure how we will weave this in, in terms of writing curriculum, preparing the materials, but one of the things I always noted when I've been on various committees is that when we talk about the infusion process, it's including and infusing, as we know, what the people did each step, each stage of the way. The people who were here first, and then as the Europeans and African people came. Now that is going to be a, a challenge. I think, and I think we want to be aware of that challenge in terms of the knowledge of the teachers. So it's not just concentrating on the African American history, what they did, because you could know that, but then if you don't put it into the proper perspective, then you defeat some of the purpose, I believe. I would agree wholeheartedly. I mean, what, what, what's an issue, something we really haven't talked about, but it's always present, is we really are talking about new forms of disseminating knowledge as well as new 
pedagogies that are necessary to uh, to develop to make sure that this material <clears throat> is infused and becomes part an integral component part of the overall educational experience. And that indeed is a challenge. It's a challenge because not often the way it's taught, at least within higher education, I mean, having taught in African American studies, I'm quite fully aware of how African American studies is often taught. And what I gather from our, our, our many conversations is that we're really trying to think about a new approach. Mm -hmm. Yes. A new approach. And, yes. and also think about the African American experience holistically as part of the American experience. Right. Not a separate episode, episode. And realize that the African American experience was both shaped yeah. by the experience of other racialized communities preceding it in the United States as well as it influenced that of others. Mm -hmm. So we see. I mean, the way I would envision it, they're seeing as part of the totality of American experience. Mm -hmm. Yes. I would agree wholeheartedly with what you said. Well, um, I would like to add to the conversation. Who are these people speaking? <laughs> I'm David Byrton. <laughs> okay, who was the other person? Is that Pedro? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, okay. Um, I would like to add, you know, part of pulling this commission together is to um, add a level of importance to this history. And I think that, you know, once this is, you know, included, whatever curriculum, that other people are going to recognize that and that individuals who are in African American studies departments or um, who are just, you know, historians in, in general um, will probably find this, you know, a means of, of motivating other students to get involved. So the way that this um, this history project develops as a result of us, you know, getting it included in into you know New York State curriculum is, I mean, is, is limitless because we we what we are committing to now is saying that this is going to be a part of the conversation. I think that you know by being open to what the future. You bring and some of the opportunities this may afford other scholars is, is definitely a way of looking at um, both of both the higher education committee as far as in addition to the Amistad Commission in general. I think to make things happen sometimes is the greatest you know motivator for um, future discovery. So. Again, I'd like to commend the um, Higher Education Committee and, and just say that we're just the catalyst for something, you know, that's about to begin and to open, you know, different views regarding, you know, the history as well as, as future discovery or future um, implications. I pray so. <laughs> I think so. Well, David, you, you're perfect timing because um, I think now we are kind of rolling into the Resource Committee report. Um, would you like to report on the activities of the Resource Committee? Sure. Um, the other thing I would, I would like to do is I would like to thank the Resource Committee because, because right now, um, as I explained to um, the committee, where I'm going through an adoption process of two kids, and my committee has been very supportive regarding even passing on information to me in my absence. Um, with that said, um, right now the Resource Committee is focusing on pulling together um, information um, for scholarly review regarding the bibliography that, that the committee has been working on. Um, in addition, um, I received you know, a list of institutions which the Resource Committee feels could contribute to the Amistad um, Commission um, objective, um, as well as kind of develop some type of um, pedagogy going forward regarding um, the use of either web-based resources, um, developing, you know, I would, I would guess, you know, institutional resources as well as, like I said before, the bibliography so that, you know, institutions will have something to um, ground the, the information of or goals relative to you know, I guess local history as well as state history. Um, I mean, with with that said, if any other um, any of the other members of the 
resource committee would like to add discussion, you know, I welcome it. Uh, I, this is Rose, and I, I just want to add um, that the this is clearly one of the areas, particularly in scholarly review, that um, in terms of curriculum guidance, curriculum guidance development in the state of New York is very critical. And in the absence of funding, um, can really make or break, um, and maybe Steve, you want to add to what that is, but I think it's important for the commission to understand, uh, because this is part of the process in setting forth curriculum guidance. Yeah. So. Or Jean, I'm sorry, because I, I forget you're on the phone. Oh, no, so, that's fine, uh, I, I, so maybe both of you could share um, with the commission the importance of this process. Well, why don't we have Joanne jump in first? <laughs> <laughs> we, we have had work plans and in different phases, but one of the most critical dimensions of uh, funding would be scholarly review uh, because it will make or break us and if you do not have the scholars agreeing that what we prepare is accurate and really does provide the African American perspective you're dead in the water also there will be costs related to uh, having a real established editor uh, and uh, well, one of the difficulties we've been developing a timeline and tense. It, it's very hard sometimes as a writer, you know, you're thinking, oh, this is back in the 1400s and I'm writing it in the past, but a timeline is in the present tense. And um, coming down today I, I, on the train, I was doing that kind of work, but it, you know, you really need a very savvy editor. Uh, you, you, well, you need multiple editors. And uh, that can be, well, Stephen will address uh, the if, dollar set if, if, I, if, if I can expand. So, I'm sorry, you, can you just highlight for folks what a scholar indeed does or what the expectations so that people understand? I think we've talked about it a little bit. Well, you are, the, the scholar is going to say that the, the statements in the work are legitimate uh, and are recognized by authorities. They will recommend additional works, scholarly works, because that's their life line. Uh, and uh, they uh, will, you know, turn us to different other resources as well. And um, you need more than one scholar. It's an absolute must because there are multiple perspectives on African American history, and so you need to have a, you know, the range among the scholars. And th there's some discussion that they'll have, which also adds to. So before we get to Steve, so there is a list that's um, being circulated that um, the commission members um, can review and provide input in terms of additional potential scholars. So the list is in formation as well. So we, uh, if I can add a few things, we, we have reached a fairly critical juncture here in, in um, the committee's work. As you all know, um, there has been no budget to do the work of the committee. Um, all of the services that have been provided, all of the efforts by people, all of the contributions have been pro bono. Yes. Um, and we have now reached a stage in this development where we, it is critical that we do have scholarly review to do some of the vetting of mm -hmm. the materials that we have put together. Yes. Uh, but not simply that, as Johan has also indicated, um, uh, it is critical that we have a respected editor on board to ensure that what we produce uh, will pass muster. And there is a third component. Um, so you, we're talking about scholarly review to get through phase one of this project, which really um, ends around September and the development of curricula begins in phase two. But it is imp critically important that we have the resources in order to get the scholarly review done just to move to phase two. Mm -hmm. 
um, and the editing done. We, of course, all realize that, that the state is in a, a, a rather critical financial situation. Um, so a great deal of this effort um, we're going to have to take a real hard look at in terms of how much resources we're asking for. We have very conservatively estimated that just to do the scholarly review and the editing to get to phase two is going to be approximately twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars. State Ed has done as much as we can possibly do. We have staff all over the department working on this initiative. Um, and it is done, you know, by the goodness of their heart and, and so on. So as well as all of you. So this is rather critical for us. The other issue that we need to be concerned about is that when we put together a budget for the state in the report, we need to make it very clear, whereas we may not necessarily be asking the state to pick up the, the large responsibility, financial responsibility here, there needs to be some contribution on the part of the state to at least fund a grant writer uh, that will help develop grants that we can then vet for approval. Um, outside of that, we, we are in a rather dire situation. Um, so this needs to be in the four minds of everyone around the table. Um, and certainly we welcome any suggestions that you might have with regard to how we proceed in that way. But I wanted to give you an idea as to where we were going here. As far as um, phase two, is it possible that um, local institutions can contribute towards the hire of uh, a writer or a grant writer? Because, you know, here at the museum, there's a possibility that we may have a funding opportunity in which we can contribute to the commission. That is absolutely possible. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, yeah I, I really want to yeah. chime in here a little bit on behalf of Dr. Manning Maribel, who is a commission member. But I had a conversation with him. Um, for those of you who know Dr. Maribel, he is foremost historian on African American history and um, has had a lot of experience with other Amistad commissions um, in our contiguous states. And um, I, he has allowed me to say this publicly, his lack of participation has really been as a result of health reasons, and he's um, awaiting, he's at the top of the list for a, a double lung transplant. So he did permit me to say that publicly, but only to just underscore that he wants to continue participating. However, um, that will be probably another four or five months in, after his recovery. Having said that, though, I was able to really um, uh, get his insight in terms of the activities. He's been well informed about the progress of the commission. But he clearly um, also underscored the need um, for that grant writing uh, person or to really jumpstart some of the activities. So again, um, the, the idea of the commission and, it, and its recommendations is that we do this responsibly saying we do know we have a mandate, but at the same time, in order to really be realistic, we're not going to tax New York State with uh, enormous costs, but certainly seed monies are necessary. Uh, some examples of, uh, of some of the private foundations that Dr. Ma uh, Maribel has had relationships with in the past to do some of this work clearly is to develop the web-based um, resources, and not only for students, which, you know, in his experiences, there's a, a wealth of information for students to access, but the, the reality is that there's also a need to develop materials for the for teachers who are within the system who are um, already there teaching for years and need access to somewhat free or uh, low cost. And so he actually, as an example of the private fundraising that he's done, has worked with the Ford Foundation in developing a web-based. Um, so those are some of the things, I think, again, that in these tight economic times, as a commission, we are working towards within each committee to say, this is what needs to be done. This is what we can do now and what we can do later, assuming that there's additional funds. And so um, that's just really, I think, is the theme of the day. Well, the reason, again, that I, I brought that up, because 
you know, I think that if that it is already, you know, some type of web-based resource in place, that maybe by using that, you know, as a catalyst to create some interest, you know, in our local communities regarding this particular initiative, I just need to know what the price of access would be and then how, you know, our resources would then come back to support what we're doing here. The, the existing, um, one of the activities, and we can do this probably either through the resource committee or higher education, either one is fine, um, but uh, he did offer to give us the, if the link is public, um, and the background materials on the development of it, he said he would uh, offer those up. So either resource committee, we could probably do it through that and, and, and our next committee meeting, really explore what the, the link is, what it makes available so we can include that as part of the recommendations. Then how would resources be taken in or how would financial contributions be made? Well, I think that, that that's part of, I think, part of the overall, um, within each committee, part of the charge of each committee that for every activity that it suggests that needs to be undertaken with respect to moving forward curriculum guidance in the way that we know it should be, that an associated cost and then you say either in kind, state, or private. And I think that's probably the way we could address it. Okay. That makes sense to everyone? Jim, yeah. is there anything you wish to contribute? I, as soon as we get off the phone, I'm going to talk to my um, commissioner regarding, you know, some funding that we received as far as um, reaching out um, of our GEAR UP program, which is a rites of passage program, um, as well as seeing if I can get a one-to-one -one match, you know, from department. Because we're developing a, a web-based learning program currently. I think, you know, being able to add some of this information, you know, to our web-based learning program would just, you know, make it a, a stronger program altogether. And maybe that money, since we don't now since we now don't have to develop that component, I can see how I can transfer some funding towards, you know, moving the project forward. That's great, David. Thank you. Jean, did you want to say anything about this? No, I, I think the conversation has been very helpful. And I think Stephen really cast the, the, the position we're in and, and really the, the importance of, of the scholarly review, review and an editor to make sure that this phase one is completed with a quality the commission can be proud of. So, so far we have our budget and formation and it's an editor, scholarly review, grant writer, and perhaps some clerical support. Yes, I have a question about the scholarly review. Um, so given, given the scope of um, uh, what the curriculum committee is asking in terms of going across the curriculum, um, would that expand the scholarly review circle a bit? Um, David just mentioned local versus local history versus uh, maybe a more global history or a more uh, national history, would that sort of expand, the, you know, uh, the range of how many reviewers may be needed and maybe impact budget? Absolutely. And I think the conversations, from what I understand, throughout each committee has been, um, while the curriculum committee has defined this vision of from K through 12 across all the seven major disciplines, that perhaps um, as a result of the cost associated with some of this scholarly review, that you bring, you know, you start with the piloting of the initial and then expanding right. accordingly. So we could probably, I guess my point is, is that there are activities that need to happen now. Right. Uh, absolutely, and then there are activities that could happen in years two, three, or four, yes. and perhaps a five-year budget is associated with, so a five-year <coughs> plan could be part of these recommendations. Mm -hmm. Things that we need to do now, things that we need to do in the short term and long term. Does that sound appropriate? Absolutely. Uh, one of the aspect of the work that we have been doing at, in state ed has to do with a visual online resource. And we have folk who have agreed 
like uh, the New York City Historical Society, has agreed to share some of their images with us. So that's an in-kind. Uh, you know, if we are looking for a particular image that we have to find, we sometimes you have to get have permissions, and there might be a minor cost. So re realistically, in our budget, we have to include that. I, but many of them, we have other institutions will donate their images so that they own. And we've talked to the people at the New York Historical Society, and there's the New York State Historical Association in Cooperstown. I, like one of the things we're looking for as a New York State manumission paper. Well, if I may uh, interject here, one of the things that I would like to see focused on uh, first in the curriculum, if we're going to narrow it, would be the fields of math and science. Yes. Those are the two fields that are being very much projected in terms of testing, but also two fields where uh, African people made fantastic contributions, which have been totally deleted. Mm -hmm. So those are the two areas, if we're going to narrow it, those are the ones where I would like to begin the infusion process, one or the other. Very good. Um, one of the things that I'm doing, you know, is I'm actually reaching out to um, Josh Brown, who's the director of the CUNY Social History Project. Is this David again? Sorry. Josh Brown. I know, but who's talking? David? Oh, uh, David Byrtle. Oh, sorry. Uh, and one reason that I'm doing this is because in reaching out to, you know, major institutions, it's very easy for, you know, once we de determine what subject matter or what period that we're looking for, for them to identify, you know, um, experts or even new scholars that are doing research relative to the subject matter that we're discussing. And that, you know, and that can help us a great deal in having to seek out, you know, individuals to do this type of scholarly review. review in part because some of these people are, are seeking their, you know, PhDs and are already in the process. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm saying that if we are going to, you know, continue along this, along this line, uh, maybe giving us, you know, some areas like, like you just did regarding, you know, science and math, and we start to, you know, develop, you know, some research material um, in those particular subjects and then start to seek out institutions that are turning out scholars, you know, yeah. with a focus in those, those interests. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, it's much easier to just pull up, you know, recent graduates, you know, with thesis dealing with African Americans in math and math and science if you know what department and what institution you know, that you're, that you're working with. I mean, since we do have institutions like Columbia and NYU right at our fingertips, why not use them? And I'm not saying that there's not other institutions that could provide that resource as well. Yeah, I think the other thing, too, is a concerted effort is being made. So as we identify scholars, um, yeah, you know, it's true that you should be paid, but there may be scholars who are, who certainly, given this current economic framework and environment, can say, I can really do this in kind, so right. that's also important. Okay, well, um, I think... May I ask a question of the commission, please? Sure. And that question is this. Have we given thought to providing a status report to the Black and Puerto Rican Caucus and the Hispanic Caucus? Because normally in February, it is budget and hearing times, and um, there is a review as to certain initiatives which become prioritized. And in or with a status report as to where we're at, we could also ask for member items or a member uh, supplement. And we see that through both the speaker's office and through uh, elected, uh, certain elected officials. That would help with uh, hard dollars. Have we given thought to uh, providing a, a status report? No, we haven't, so I guess it's a good idea that you're suggesting. Yeah. Um, I, I just, my own uh, knowledge, though, in terms of um, member items, it, they con coincide with the budget year, so um, it is another possible um, 
source that we can include as part of our recommendations. Um, although my understanding is that you were always, you know, after the fact, these these member items are consistent with the budget are sought in to October and November and submitted by the state legislature by January. So my, my, I just want to be realistic that it is certainly an area that we should go. We could look into, Ruth, I don't know if you have any suggestions, but we can look into what the best way to communicate to the black and uh, I know they have the, the conference in two weeks, so I don't know if there's, we can talk to them during the conference and uh, present it to them. But they have hearings during that, uh, in, in two weeks they'll hold hearings. Um, no, I'm talking about the Black and um, Puerto Rican Caucus. They're going to the conference. They the have conference. a conference. They have a conference, and it's going to happen in two weeks. Right, and at that conference, there are hearings on certain items that are germane to the caucus that they feel are priorities. This would be one of those items. In addition, we would not only limit ourselves to a member item, that was a suggestion, but we could seek supplemental funding for commissions. That has happened in the past. Okay, okay. It we can look a into great it. Deal of money, but it certainly can get us started like as basic seed funds. Having <laughs> 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 having been part of the par the uh, coordinating efforts of Black and Puerto Rican caucuses in the past, um, we can see what their agenda is like, but um, we can see who the contact people are. One of the first steps we might consider in terms of outreach are the signatories to the bill that form exactly. the commission. Okay. Uh, That's a good idea. And let them vet it with their colleagues and, and so forth. We can call Assemblyman Rights Office. Mm -hmm. Yes. And those signatories will also, uh, we should provide them with a private uh, status review yes. before yes. we go uh, before the caucus. We'll call the office there, but Dr. Ballinger, would you like to be a part of that process? Yes, I would. Okay. I would like to very much. But you have to let me know because I'm, you know, I'm on the way down here in no man's land. Back to Albany. It's usually the reverse, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't want to go there. I know. <laughs> but now that I work in the city, I can say that. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Um, any other comments before we move on? to the next item of the agenda, which is really um, state education. The survey. The survey. The survey. Yes. Yeah. So, we're, uh, so we're done with committee reports, and so we're up to um, state education departments. I'm going to give you a little history lesson <laughs> of the surveys. Uh, in the 1980s, the curriculum office developed a materials for eighth grade social studies. Now the courses have changed somewhat over since that period, but at, at that time, eighth grade was uh, an American history course essentially, and uh, it was felt at the, the time there was not enough uh, African American perspective in that publication, and what they did they actually pulled together juniors and seniors, African-American students from basically the big five. Oh, there she is. And uh, what, the, what they did, they asked those students what their experience had been when they were in middle school. And um, what those students did, they, they identified certain themes that they said were never touched upon in all in their experiences. And uh, so they identified themes and uh, after they had had a study group uh, that was directed by a social studies supervisor in Buffalo, her name was Aura Curry. But it was interesting that their perspective was so different than what a uh, general population, well, a, a white classroom teacher and students thought. And uh, it was very telling. And so knowing that experience, when we, we developed the student survey 
And it was it's important to us to know who the respondents were. Because Someone has left the conference. We know that, that, that there's such a difference of the, their perspectives. And so we did develop a student survey, and we also developed a school district survey. But we're going to talk predominantly about the, uh, the uh, student survey right now. Each of the surveys ha had, one had 11 questions and the other had 13 questions. And the demographics we used were what was used in the 1990s federal census and also what we, the kinds of demographics we use on the school report cards. So we didn't just make them up. They, they were existing entity. And David, do you want to? Sure. Um, this is David Mahoney from State Education. Um, I'm going to quickly take you through um, some of the outcomes and results of the survey. Um, to give you a little more background on our thinking, um, we effectively we use the survey as a tool um, to mine for information and to, to really, you know, challenge the students to think about, you know, what are some of the best practices that are out there? Um, what are your specific areas of interest? And um, more notably, what we're going to talk about today is, you know, what does the student profile look like and, and the, the types of, of respondents we were able to get? Um, just to set the scene a little further, we had about 2,000 total respondents to the survey. Um, which was disseminated statewide through a host of uh, outreach resources that we utilized um, by means of state education and Department of State resources. Um, so we got about 2,000 total respondents for the survey itself. Uh, approximately 66% of the respondents came to us from what we, we would typically consider to be middle school students, which is grades 5 through 8. And 27% of the respondents came to us uh, by way of a high school student, um, which is typically grades 9 through 12. 60% um, of these total respondents. Someone uh, has left the conference. 60% of these total respondents came to us from um, what they would classify or qualify as a suburban setting, um, and 83% uh, of those students, uh, this being the total respondents, were actually from public schools at large. Um, so that's more a reflection of what the student profile looks like. Um, to, to talk about really some of the outcomes or the themes from the survey. Uh, about 80% of the respondents indicated that they seldom to sometimes learn about African Americans during the course of the regular school day. Okay. Mm -hmm. More specifically, uh, about 10% indicated that on a daily basis they are emerged in and exploring issues related to African American history. A quarter of respondents uh, indicated that they are exploring these issues on a weekly basis and the majority of the responses, which was approximately 43%, indicated that they're tackling um, this African American history on a monthly basis in the classroom. Um, <laughs> Joanne and I um, have the task ahead of us of de-aggregating this data much, much further. Because a as I indicated going into this, it we really wanted to just set the scene and get an idea of what our student population looked like. Um, and. and what we're going to do in moving forward is, you know, kind of parse out some of this information relative to what are the students identifying as their best practices? Um, what do they believe to be their specific areas of interest and the topic matter that is and is not being covered? Um, and some further recommendations from the students. I believe we had a question, you know, is there anything else you would like to tell us? Um, something in that, to that regard. Um, so in moving forward, I think this survey is going to be a really good tool um, for the respective committees in that as we start to get input directly from these students relative to what is of interest to them, what isn't really of interest to them, and some of those best practices that are being utilized in the classroom, I think that will be a, a useful tool for us uh, in moving forward. That being said, I still do believe that to the extent practicable, we do need to try to um, further our outreach efforts. Um, given that the student uh, profile or the demographic po profile of these students was roughly about 70% white out of the 2,000 respondents, um, I feel we, we should certainly look to explore additional opportunities for outreach. Um, so with that in mind, um, I'd be happy to once again share the survey to all of the commission members and ask and plea with you um, that, that we can certainly you know, disseminate this further.
Before you continue, you I just want to acknowledge that the Secretary of State uh, came into the meeting. How do you, how do you, I, how do you distribute it so that, do you do it through schools? How do you do it for students where, yeah. where you get the responders? We did that by reaching out to, uh, we have conference calls with professional organizations in all the content areas. And so in my office, which runs those calls, we asked each of the groups to reach out to uh, their professional organizations. And we also, all of the content, has left the content areas, they reach out uh, to uh, the big five. And uh, one of my colleagues uh, works with the Middle Schools Association. And she also reached out to that group, which may explain why uh, they're a very proactive group. Uh, but we still need to have a bigger, larger and outreach. There were some additional resources. We did send um, the survey itself to um, the respective district superintendents um, throughout New York State, as well as I believe we provided a link on um, the state education homepage mm -hmm. um, for parents, students, and administrators alike to have access to. Um, and Anciano's group, I believe, which is our curriculum and instruction group, they have what they call a um, well, e e an e blast, and it went is, out in the e blast, which is nothing more than just a listserv of practitioners yeah. um, statewide. But one 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 way to sometimes short circuit that is to just target a few superintendents mm -hmm. and say, you know, Buffalo, Yonkers, and some districts in New York, and just say. We're really interested in your participation in this, the student, the hearing from the students, so that you, you know, maybe Long Island, you know, Roosevelt, you know, because I think that if you target it just a little bit, the response rate, although it's good in terms of age, in terms of ethnicity, you may get a larger participation um, if we target it a little bit. I mean, obviously, you know that once you target it, the information may be um, not as scientific as, as a random one. However, you might get value in what children are saying that they do have access to and they don't have access to. Um, even though our, our goal is to make sure that it is for all students and all teachers. So, I mean, I like the fact that 70% of the respondents are white so that they can see what's not even available to them. But I'd also like to get a little more diversity in that. We did sample before we mounted the, the survey. And it was interesting. Uh, they were mainly relatives of people in the department. Uh, but, but, well, it, uh, you know, you're trying just to see. You know, we, we learned a lot from that because the Someone language was the too complicated. Right. <clears throat> but... Uh, Thank you, whoever that was. <laughs> but uh, they uh, trying to bit, bit here. Uh, it, one of the interesting things we asked students: Where do they learn about African American history outside of the classroom? And we uh, we know that from many African Americans tell us they didn't learn much about African American history in the classroom, they learned it at home or, or in other right. community activities that they're involved in. Right. Well, uh, Mary Carter, I would agree, too, with the um, outreach into uh, Long Island. You know, you have Unidale and uh, Westbury and uh, Amityville, different communities, and you have Glen Cove on the other end, mm -hmm. uh, which could give another yes. rounding of perspective. Mm -hmm. The one of the, I'm um, sorry, go ahead, Lisa. I had gotten some feedback, so I work in a school up the state, and um, okay. Jeff McClellan is a friend of mine. Oh. Yeah, so yeah. I asked Jeff to send it out again. <laughs> I was like, can you send this out to everybody? Um, and then I just called people that I knew personally and said, can you, you know, try and have your students do this? I even went and had my volleyball team come to my house, and each of them did yeah. <laughs> my computer. I'm like, see what you think of this. But um, just to get their, their thoughts, and um, sort of privately, some of the feedback I had gotten was, I'm sure a lot of superintendents are not pursuing this because they certainly don't want to have it reflect poorly on Precisely, the district. Yeah. Right. That, you Precisely. know, especially where I am, it's not much, there isn't much right. diversity. And right. some of those superintendents that I talked talk to, 
wouldn't want it to, to reflect that there isn't anything going on in that way of the state, where kids are perceiving that there's nothing really available to them. So, and teachers that, often sure felt it was punitive that, you know, if everybody found out that the kids in my class right. says this, right. and so they were very nervous about mm -hmm. the student survey. Yes, uh, uh, that was one of the realities so that they really had to right. face because, you know, there were over 700 school districts, so that means 700 superintendents, and we sent them to all of these superintendents, and we got 2,000 kids to respond. Wow. So clearly, there is an effort not to have children look at this and respond to it and, and so forth. Um, and in the other survey, which we won't talk about so much today, but the district survey, um, the discussion was very, even more interesting because you, you got what the superintendents wanted you to know. <laughs> you know? Um, and we can't verify that that's actually based in some form of reality or not, you know, so. Sort of like when I sat on the Regents. Right. <laughs> right. Interesting. If that, all of that is right. going on, then why are we so, in the state of affairs that we yeah. are? <laughs> yeah. So th those are just some of the challenges that we have faced and will continue to face, and certainly we can do a more targeted outreach. But as you, Madam Secretary, has pointed out, that might skew the the uh, uh, the, um, the feedback in such a way that we don't want anyone to point to it with criticism and say this really isn't a scientific study. But so we'll have to make sure that we we do an outreach that is truly inclusive but targeted. Yeah. You know because right. we we'll need to target um, predominantly white districts as well as districts and schools that are not, and maybe we can just look at yeah. what percentage basically across the state are we talking about in terms of yeah. the makeup of kids. And, and the message, I mean, I mean it's a, the message that they get in terms of what its use is, it's not, it's not a reflection on you, their curriculum right. is not developed yet. Right. So. You don't need to personalize your inaction because right. we can excuse you because you didn't have something to act with. But, you know, so I mean, if people need that, so messaging it to, to superintendents and stuff, it's, it's about a forward movement rather than a, than, a, than a state of affairs that they think that they're going to be charged with, like, oh, God, one more thing, what, did I, what didn't I do? And so if it's give them a little wiggle room to feel a comfort so that they don't, that they don't discourage participation. Yeah. You might want to, I think, through just group as well, because I think they um, work a lot with the school librarians. I know for some of the teachers I had emailed and whatnot, um, that I knew would be interested in giving their kids a survey. They said, I don't really have a place to do that in my room so much, but when they go to library, especially for the younger groups, but my sister who happens to be a librarian had her kids, you know, oh. as they came in, but they're elementary, so she did, you know, just the older grades. But, um, but the, you know, if you target some of those groups that might have more time, they're not so crunched curriculum-wise that they're, they can't take a chunk of time during the day. Um, librarians are one of the few that are a little bit, have a little bit more freedom with their curriculum, I think, and can oh. do that. In the, in the conference calls we have, the school librarians who are in our office too, uh, I did go on their conference call and gave them the links and uh, yeah. first of all, thank you for taking it on. Uh, so that's for before we even move forward and talk about what we could be doing. David did a, a, yeah, <laughs> so thank you for taking it on. Excellent um, job, David. And um, it'll be interesting if we had like a little companion piece for teachers, you know. Well, they are very nervous. But mm -hmm. we know that now. Yeah, so it would it'd be great to see, you know. So um, I would love to, but but I think it's it's a good first step because we do want to have something to unveil in our report by May. I had a fourth grade teacher who called me, and she said, "I how can I give this to my fourth graders?" And you know, I I I have a colleague who is a three and a half year old who can go on the net and, and just do fine. But she and she said, besides, they don't know anything. Right. <laughs> then that actually answered the question. 
<laughs> and every other question yes, you may have asked. Yeah, right. that. yeah. Like confession. So, yeah. That's good. Um, so I look forward to, to, to getting more on this and, and on the other committees. I just have to really thank you because I know that as we have, you know, we're all strapped for resources, you know, and we're all, but we're still committed to get this project done. As we disaggregate the data more and, and do more outreach, but it, they are very telling some of the things. Yeah, you yeah. can read into just right. what we've done thus far. Right, right, right. I also think that that's good for the, the to let the chancellor know that, mm -hmm. or your commission. I forget what we call them now. The chancellor and the commission. I think yeah. it's important to inform them of what this is finding because half the time they always think that. When advocates come in, that it's all subjective, or, well, right, and so that they need to know that that you know that that even in this preliminary kind of data, it's telling the kind of um, concern that's out there. So, right, just highlight it for them. So, I think that would be great because I think that it's this curriculum or any other curriculum that would be outside of the traditional norm will probably run up against the same thing. So, yeah. Great. So, All right. that was the end of the meeting. So uh, our next meeting, our next uh, meeting is in um, May. But in between May and now, <laughs> we need to I have a lot of work and I need to have some subcommittee meetings. So. It would be great if the subcommittees could meet in a month, and then we could follow up with each subcommittee. Within two or three weeks, the subcommittees meet. And then, um, so that we can come back. When we come back May, we'll hear from the subcommittees and come out with unveiling our plan and giving that, presenting that to the governor and to the Board of Regents. Right. Right. The committees are supposed to bring also a draft of recommendations, right? So yeah. if they can set that in April, right. then, and so everybody can read it before the meeting in May, it will be good. Right, and we'll send that out in the communication. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. No tickets? Cool. Who's on the phone? Thank you very much. All right, I'm leaving now. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I know Pedro. Someone has left the conference. Yeah. Was, was in the, thank you. Oh, yeah, that's great. Oh, she's. She's kind of super. Yeah. Kind of super. She's kept this yeah. on track. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Madam Secretary, let me introduce my colleague, David Pony. David, how are you? He works great. directly with me at the park. Okay, great. Yes, yes. And how are you doing? Just going up just to have a budget meeting. Oh, yeah. Ask me after the meeting. <laughs> I, I can then imagine. How you I said, what is it with me? Uh -huh. When I was in the Koch administration, when I rolled over to the Dinkins, because I stayed with Dinkins for a year and a half, I said, we have these like severe budgets. We have these like glory days, and then we go through the slump. Yes. Yes. So oh. it's you then. How are you guys doing?